Well, good morning, finally. Welcome to the Federal Quality Institute's special dialogue with Dr. Peter Drucker. I'm sorry about the delays. I understand they were technical problems. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to forego the, the break and go straight through so we can have the full benefit of a dialogue with Dr. Drucker. Now, I'm honored, as you know, to be out here in California with Dr. Drucker. And I want to first start out, Dr. Drucker, by saying thank you for donating your time uh, to talk with us as we're struggling to change the way the federal government does business. And I know most of you probably know a lot about Dr. Drucker, but I want to highlight a few things. Uh, Dr. Drucker is the preeminent management expert of our time. He's been a mentor to leaders in business, nonprofit organizations, and governments, including the, the U.S. government. For more than a half a century, he's been writing books on economics, management, and leadership. 27 books, I believe, right, Dr. Drucker? And they've been translated into more than 20 languages. Uh, one that's kind of interesting to me was 25 years ago, you wrote a, a book on the age of discontinuity. And I'm like, 25 years ago? I thought that was new stuff. I guess, I guess we run in cycles. Uh, but beyond all of those credentials, um, and you have his bio in your packet, Dr. Drucker has been a mentor to my previous employer, Herman Miller, and the chairman of the board of Herman Miller, Max Dupree. And most recently, uh, a friend and mentor to me, and I want to thank you for, for that, Dr. Drucker. Now, what we're, we're going to do in the interest of time is ask uh, Dr. Drucker to give some remarks to us about his, uh, both the post-capitalistic society, his most recent book, which are, is provocative and controversial, as well as some of the advanced questions that were sent by many of you. But Dr. Drucker, let me just give you a, a sense of who's in the audience. Uh, we've got a diverse group of people, including uh, uh, government leaders from the Office of Personnel Management, from the, the Office of Civil Rights, from the Department of Education, from the Department of Labor, Department of Interior. We've got people, fr uh, leaders from U.S. Customs. We've got the president of the largest federal union, uh, AFG. GE, we've got uh, government leaders from U.S. Patent and Trademark, uh, the Peace Corps, uh, the Smithsonian Institute, I said justice, didn't I, and the Vice President's Office of uh, National Performance Review. And, I, and I, challenge, let me, I challenge you to begin to fax your questions as you're listening to Dr. Drucker. But, and be, be, uh, be candid, because I guarantee you Dr. Drucker will be. And so, Dr. Drucker, I, I hope, hope you'd begin with sharing some of your thoughts on what we're doing and what's happening kind of in the overall transformation that's occurring in our society. Well, thank you very much, Michelle Hunt. And let me start out by saying that I'm greatly honored to be here with you after so many years of friendship and working together and so greatly honored to speak to such a distinguished audience and I'm particularly happy that somebody from the Peace Corps is in the audience because my last government assignment was my second stint, by the way, on the advisory board of the Peace Corps mm. uh, 25 years ago. And I was on the first advisory board. And so I feel very close to the Peace Corps. Uh, before I start, let me say, that I'm speaking as an outsider. Yes, both Mr. Truman and Mr. Eisenhower considered me for a sub-cabinet job, and I was wise enough to say no, because I, I do only damage in a big organization. Mm. I've learned it long ago. But uh, my government assignments, and I never was a government employee, I was always a friend and the handholder, uh, oh, and the utility outfielder uh, is all, well, then my last assignments were in the early Kennedy years. So I'm speaking as an outsider, and I hope you will forgive me my ignorance, which will become very soon very apparent. But an outsider has also one advantage 
first is dispensable yeah. and expendable, and I'm going to say things you are, are not necessarily going to be very happy with, I'm afraid. Uh, but let me start out by saying that I was tremendously impressed by the material you sent me, Michel, about the work uh, you and that whole uh, effort has been doing. And I have about, oh, I would say two feet of press release on my desk. And reading it also is very impressive. And so the first question I would ask, and it's a question which one of the questioners asked, is why has it not had any echo? Why nobody knows about it? Uh, all right, a year and a half ago, when the vice president announced his program to reinvent government, that was met by a nationwide yawn we had all heard it before. Mm -hmm. This was another PR exercise. And now, a year and a half later, there are those solid, tremendous achievements, and still nobody pays attention. And why? Well, in part, perhaps, if I'm, as an old journalist may say, uh, because you kind of trickle out results here, results there. Nobody gets a feeling. I had no idea until you sent me all that material of the massive effort and the effort that cuts across the government. Uh, and uh, one gets a feeling that here is a little improvement in one place and it's, yeah, okay. And here is another one. And one gets no feeling of the massive, ongoing, hard work that cuts across so many agencies and across the government. Uh, and that may be a, uh, a problem of communications. Mm -hmm. But there is another problem. Uh, I took most of the material you sent me and sat down with two old friends one is a managing editor of a major paper, and one is a university president of a substantial university, both, by the way, good Democrats. And they were totally unimpressed. Hmm. They said, these are things we expect subordinates to do without being told. They are minor improvements. And here is the Department of Agriculture, which my impression is has done more than any other agency. But I hope you don't mind my saying that the first time I worked on a program to close down uh, a lot of county farm agents was in the Eisenhower years. And even then, these were all in places where there ain't no farmers. And there haven't been any for a good long time. And here is that customs office, which is uh, trying to make it a little easier for the customers. And these are improvements. And in fact, one of those two people, my newspaper friend who, is embarrassed, who himself has a lot of government experience, said, you know, uh, reading this material only confirms my belief that the government is hopeless. Because if these are improvements for which you have to work, then the built-in resistance the built-in inertia is so enormous. And there is something to it. But at the same time, this, this reaction, and it is, I would say, the common reaction you have outside, perhaps even inside Washington, misses 
what I thought is your main achievement. And the one to build on, that for the first time, and I've been around a long time, mm -hmm. I came to this country to report on the uh, uh, Roosevelt land election for a group of British people. So I've been around a long time. For the first time, there's receptivity. Yeah. You have created receptivity. You have created uh, a, uh, a sensitivity, a willingness. And that is an enormous achievement. And now the question is, what is really needed to capitalize on it? what is needed so that, you know, in one of the releases you sent to me, somebody said, politicians come and politicians go. Well, they usually go very fast, if an old timer can say that. And um, you know, what is needed so that this becomes a way of life, a habit of continuing improvement? And that bluntly is lacking so far. If you ask me what is now needed, and I don't ask me how to do it, because that is not something one can just improvise. How does one build the habit of continuing improvement with measurable goals? One of the questions you sent me. Uh, let me read it, because I think it's a very important question is um, uh, the, the president by executive order has asked federal agency to develop customer service standards fashioned after the best in business. Do you believe this is achievable in government? Well, the question goes much further. Can you, in government, establish across the board, improvement standards in every major area. Can you benchmark, bluntly? And not just with government. And I think this is the point of the executive order, that if you just um, do what uh, basically the General Accounting Office has been trying to do for years, or the uh, Bureau of uh, management, office of management, then budget, budget and management, management budget, which is really benchmark within government. No. Can you actually establish a system in which government agencies constantly measure themselves against the best anybody does, whether it's a hospital or a university or a business? And you may say businesses have a very different bottom line, but non-profit institutions do not, and yet a good many of them do benchmark themselves. And I think this is the next, and I think very big challenge, to build into the entire executive branch uh, the, uh, the habit of Im continuous improvement with measurable goals, not in all agencies you can't. I don't think you could basically uh, establish a standard for the Supreme Court would be very difficult. But you can sure establish standards of case handling for um, the district courts and the courts of appeal, and they vary tremendously in their effectiveness. Uh, and in some, so can you now go beyond uh, spot welding, beyond doing this here and that here and establish an across the board standard, a uh, habit of continuous improvement. And I think this would be the first thing that is absolutely needed. Uh, and it is needed for a very simple reason. Bluntly, you have today a demoralized federal bureaucracy. Demoralized, and again, this is a question I have here asked. Um, 
the American people, the first question, have become increasingly distrustful of the government over the last 30 years. The level of trust has dropped from about 75%. Uh, that would be, I would say, the Eisenhower Kennedy years mm -hmm. uh, to less than 20%. Well, yes. And it is inside and outside. And very bluntly, the, the question asks, how do you explain it? Well, the explanation is very simple. There has been no performance. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing to do is to get across. And I would say my first public would not even be the outside public. Because I'm going to t tell you something which m any when you knew it, when you were a human resources VP, you know that the public awareness of your company is made by your employees. Yeah. And the public awareness of the federal government is made by the federal government people. And when I talk to our mailman about government, he is uh, a cynic. He doesn't believe that government can do anything. He is very unhappy about the poor level of service, and nothing happens. So can your first public, I would say, is insight. Can you get across to them that pride, nothing builds as much pride as a continuous habit of improvement. This is one of the things the Japanese taught us. And how do you do it? And that would be my first goal, far beyond these individual improvements. I think you have now proven that there's receptivity. The next step is to prove that it can become an institutional habit, a rejuvenation habit. Uh, when I talk to one of those people, uh, this was my university president, and he looked to all that stack you sent me, and I said, uh, Charlie, what's your main impression? And he said, the government suffers from a fairly advanced case of institutional Alzheimer's disease. That's in Alzheimer's disease, you, I, you, know, you see, isn't it amazing Today, she recognized her, her daughter. Uh, those moments of lucid intervals, that's what impression you get. Can you move from that to uh, a pride? This is our job. We are proud. We are beating everybody else in the government. We are beating everybody else outside of the government in improvement, in service, in efficiency, in uh, making life simpler for everybody, including our own people, and you make it very difficult for government employees today. Uh, uh, and you know, I showed what the Vice President just sent to the Congress. You sent me a list to one of those two people, and one of them looked at me and said, Peter, how much of this is stuff that 10 years ago the Grace Commission proposed? And I said, I looked at it, my guess is about three quarters, and nothing happened then. And you all, I'm not, now, these are not things that are new, these are things that we have been talking about and nothing happened. And you have to overcome that uh, deeply ingrained feeling that we all know what needs to be done, but it, nothing happens, and build it into the system. And that would be my next question. But you know the Vice President announced a program to reinvent government, and I don't like big slogans. Uh, I think the, we have had too many, but there is need to reinvent government. We have reached the point 
we are not to do it is going to be an invitation to disaster. Now I'm going to be very serious. Look, a year and a two years, not a year and a half ago, 20% of the American public voted for Mr. Perot, and another 20% would have voted if, say, for a different personality with the same program. Uh, and there is very little doubt that beginning in another year or year and a half, the deficit will again balloon, will have to balloon. There's no way you can keep it down. Maybe you can postpone that until after the next presidential election. I'm not sure. Uh, but even if uh, uh, the big programs that are now before the Congress, health care and welfare, do not go through uh, with the additional spending. Uh, the increase in spending is built into our existing commitments. And so the deficit is bound to balloon. And uh, then there is the enormous danger that federal government will do what so much of industry has done the pressure to cut will become irresistible. And then somebody takes a meat ax and cuts. And we know that this isn't the way to do it. We know from enough businesses that they announce we are cutting off 12,000 people this year. That's the last cut. And a year later, they cut another 12,000 and a year later another 12,000 and results don't improve because they cut you know, what surgeons have an old saying that the most important thing the young surgeon has to learn is to have to have a diagnosis before he amputates. And that's not so easy to learn. Mm -hmm. And there is that danger. And I think this is a time precisely because you have created the receptivity to look at government from the point of view of reinventing it, of really saying what if we have to shrink by 40%, that would be my guess, within the next five to 10 years. Uh, and the pressure, I am afraid, will become irresistible uh, to the point where it will override the reluctance of the Congress to inflict pain on anybody. Uh, and then don't begin. Then one has to have a plan. Then one has to be prepared. And the plan that does not start out with what do we cut, but a plan that starts out with what do we maintain and strengthen. Then one has to look at strengths and tell them one has to ask very nasty questions. Of all the departments, of all the reports you sent me, the one that perhaps shows the most action is agriculture. But you know, the question needs to be asked with farmers down to 3% of the population, do we still need a Department of Agriculture? And I know I'm going to shock you by saying that some, I don't know what proportion of the American people, but a very large one would say no. We need probably a bureau or someplace in it. But a department for 3% of the population And then one also asks, yes, here is an agency that the mission is a good one and the necessary one, but have they had results? And if they haven't had results, someone asks, the mission is important, then clearly, not clearly, but almost, well, prima facie probability, their basic assumptions are wrong. Let me give you a simple example, and if my prejudices show, they're old ones, because it's a field in which 
have been trained by the world's greatest expert. The greatest expert, the greatest expert on safety was Hyman Rickover. And he trained me at the hard way as he was not, I worked pretty closely with him at one time when I was advi the advisor to the Secretary of Defense. Uh, and the basic assumption of OSHA, which is that safety, that accidents are caused by unsafe environment, is simply the wrong assumption. We have known that now for 35 years. The right assumption is accidents are caused by unsafe behavior, which OSHA pays no attention to. And so perhaps a question here, OSHA, and God help us, it's needed. And yet when you look at the safety record, it hasn't improved. OSHA has had no impact on the safety record. Working terribly hard and good people and dedicated people. And then one says, they are trying to do the right thing with the wrong tools. What, and this is what I think is needed now. And you have laid the foundation, you have created the receptivity. But if you don't use this and use it fast to go to work on really seeing if and when the time comes where one can do something really fundamental, well, if you don't have a plan, then the meat tax will do it and predictably the things that will be cut are the things that should be strengthened because they are the things that don't have lobbyists. And this, I think, is talked, I ask me what is leadership in government today? Leadership in government internally, I'm not talking politics, policies, I'm not talking North Korea, I'm not talking uh, GATT, I'm not talking big policy issues, I'm talking saving government, reinventing government. Leadership in government today is to ask what is the mission, what are the things that work. Always start out with what works so that you make sure they don't get damaged when the rough time comes, and it comes always. And what are the things that you know what, maybe need not be done at all or need be done totally differently. All the proposals we have had so far, and yours is the first exception, focused on cutting expenditures, uh, like Peter Peterson's book, which, mm -hmm. which is the wrong approach. It leads to the wrong results, the right approach it, our problem is not that we spend too much, sure we do. Our problem is that we don't perform enough. And so that this is that leadership in government now is to say what is performance, what are the things to be strengthened, what are the things to be changed, what are the things to be done away with, so that when the time comes, when the pressure to do something becomes irresistible, and it's maybe one third, maybe two fifths of the American public, totally disenchanted and ready to cut. It'll come very soon. It, can, it may come very soon. Then one has a plan and one can give leadership to the effort. Those are the kind of things I would say but let me go back and see the public reaction to what you have done is the wrong one. It's a reaction to the individual things you have done, and yes, very bluntly, in any self-respecting, even hospital, university, business, most of the things you would do automatically, you wouldn't need high-powered people like you or the people who are listening to me, you would expect that woman who runs the tabulating room to have done it. Uh, because they are clerical, very large, they are routine. And yet, 
it's a wrong reaction to dismiss it because you have created a receptivity. You have shown that there is willingness. You have shown that there is uh, the energies are there. That you have shown that with a little leadership, the results are there. Run with it, but run soon and run fast. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Jocker. I think that we're, we're are we ready now to uh, put in the clip? Yes. What we're going to do, because you're, you're faxing in questions, and I think Dr. Drucker's given us a good framework and some very okay. thoughtful and provocative uh, things to, to consider. I want you to continue to fax in your questions. However, we're going to go to a quick, just three-minute clip that's going to focus on, and I want you to see this, Dr.